431 in your hymnal together, 431, I found a friend who is all to me, his love is ever true, 431, let's all stand together as we sing, on that first together, I found a singing tonight. Good to see you back in church, and uh, boy, that was a good service this morning, wasn't it? And uh, music was just outstanding, and I uh, enjoyed every bit of it, and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. Thanks for being back in church on Sunday evening. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for another opportunity to gather together here on Sunday night, and Lord, it's always great to come together with the people of God, and what a, what a great song to sing. I'm saved, saved, saved. And thank you for a great salvation that you provided for us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'll be pleased tonight with our service and that you will meet with us this evening. Uh, Lord, give us exactly what you know we need tonight. Use the music and use our fellowship together and then honor the preaching of the word of God once again. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 340 in your hymnal, 340, oh, what a Savior that he died for me, verily, verily, 340. We're going to sing that first, second, and last together. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me, from condemnation he has made me free. He that believeth on the Son.
just a few announcements, and that'll be the regular schedule this week, and uh, we'll be here Wednesday night for our midweek service, and then uh, Thursday, and of course, uh, down at the prison with the RU, Friday right here uh, with Farmers Unanimous, Saturday morning for our soul winning and visitation at 10 a.m., and then, of course, right into next Sunday. And remember, next Sunday evening, uh, we'll have the uh, group from Howes Anderson College here uh, with us, and uh, we'll have a good time together with them, and we'll have some ice cream after the service. So plan to stay uh, next Sunday evening for a little bit, get a chance to talk with the group, and uh, we'll have a good time with them. Uh, we will. Now, next Sunday, we probably, because of that Sunday night, I'm trying to think what we should do here. I want to need to have one more meeting with all our Bible school workers. And um, just so you, uh, did anybody think Bible school was this week? The bulletin said Bible school next week. This, this is this week already. It's next week, right? So it's the 11th through the 14th. And uh, we, we need to meet one more time and make sure we're all on the same page with what we're going to be doing. Um, trying to think when we should meet. Because I want to do it after church Sunday night because we'll want to go and uh, go next door. So, um Let's, uh, wow, I don't know if you want to meet Sunday morning after church or not. Um, what do you think? Don't mumble, talk to me. I'm not ready. <laughs> Can't do it tonight. We can do it Wednesday night if you want to do it Wednesday night. All right, we can be plan on that meeting Wednesday night then and get you set, okay? That'll work out just fine, okay? And uh, we'll plan on doing that right after the service on Wednesday evening, okay? And uh, Vacation Bible School just around the corner. All right, I think that's all I have right now. Look around to see if anybody's here tonight. Anybody for the first time? I don't think I see anybody. All right, let's hear from the choir. One hundred ninety-three in your hymnal. One ninety-three. I traveled alone upon this lonesome way. Jesus, hand me one ninety-three. <coughs> we'll sing all three stanzas of Jesus and me together. <coughs> On that first, I traveled alone.
have a couple anniversaries to celebrate this evening uh last week i think both were on uh, june 28th as well i think um jim and margaret talladay this was number 52 all right and uh, jim robbed the cradle amen and uh chuck and cynthia linderman also june 28th wasn't it yeah june 28th they're newlyweds at 37 years married i think at 30 how many 36, oh, 36 years, okay, don't want to, 36, boy, 52 and 36, 88 years of marriage there, that's uh, quite a, we, we ought to have them come up and tell us how it, how it works, amen, <laughs> and uh, give us your uh, advice on that, but come on up, we want to honor you this evening, and uh, give you a card and some flowers, and uh, celebrate uh, 36 years and 52 years of wedded bliss, amen. That's great. Wonderful. Careful now, folks. <laughs> Supposed to help her up there, Jim. Well, let's go to 126 together. One, two, six. And as you find that, if you'll stand, we'll sing My Country, Tis of the Sweet Land of Liberty. Of the I sing. One, two, six. On that first together. My country, tis of the sweet land of liberty.
please greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. The instruments will play through a few times. Father's God to thee, author of liberty. As you find your seats, let's sing that last together. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. ushers are coming. We'll get our offering tonight. Well, pray to be prepared to give, and it's got it blessed and blessed you through the week. And um, remember, a month from now, August seventh, will be our special offering, and uh, we're gonna uh, we we should know here in about another week or so, maybe um, try to get some price on what we're looking at to get carpeting. We had somebody measure. Uh, so we kind of know how much we'll need, and then we'll go about looking uh, for some uh, good, durable carpeting that'll look good in here and last a while. And uh, this definitely needs to be needs help, and uh, so it's uh, it'll look much much better when we do that. So uh, we'll we'll take the offering on August seventh for that carpeting. We'll try to get a figure so we know what we're aiming for. And because uh, I learned a while ago, if you don't if you don't aim at anything, you'll never hit it, you know. So uh, we got to aim at something, amen. So uh, we'll do that, but be praying about what the Lord would have you to do on that day. Well, let's ask God's blessing on the giving tonight, Brother Wallace. Lead us in our prayer. It's your mercy every day, Father. As we uh, prepare to open up your word, Lord, help us to be attentive to what is being taught. Lord, thank you for the message that we had this morning. Lord, thank you that we can say we're a soldier of your army. And Father, I just pray that, uh, Lord, the Holy Spirit will work tonight. And then, uh, Lord, if there's one person here that does not know that they're a soldier of your army, Lord, I pray you open up their understanding. Lord, and that uh, his will, your will will be done, and he'll accept your son as his, uh, his or her Savior. Lord, bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
appreciate Catherine playing this evening, and uh, Lisa's in the home stretch, <laughs> and uh, uh, Davy being due the last uh, last few weeks here. So uh, be praying for them and for all to be well, and uh, Lord sends the right people at the right time, and uh, appreciate him sending the Call Callahans again our way at the right time, and uh, appreciate them being willing to serve. Acts 9 for our scripture reading tonight. Acts chapter 9, please. Acts 9, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9 of Acts chapter 9, and we'll read the verses responsibly. If we begin together on 1, and I'll read 2, we'll alternate till we end together on verse 9 of Acts chapter 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1. Ready? And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Lord, we want to thank you again for the Bible, and thank you again for giving us copies of your word that we hold in our hands tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be prepared to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening. Give us all those ears to hear uh, the still, small voice of the Spirit of God. I pray you'd bless the special to that end, that our hearts would be good soil, that the Word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening, and Lord, we ask for your help tonight as we open up your word once again. And Lord, I pray that you help each one of us to give our careful attention to your word tonight, and Lord, I pray that each of us would yield ourselves to you right now, that we would desire to be used of God. Lord, it's the only life we have. If you would happen to give us three score and ten, we'd like it to be used of God. Lord, all that will matter when we face you one day is whether we did what you placed us here on earth to do. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me as I bring the message tonight, and please help each individual as they listen. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do here in our midst. And I'll thank you for it, for I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 9, please, where you were reading just a few moments ago. Uh, outside of the Lord Jesus himself, probably the man that was most used of God on the earth would be the Apostle Paul, as we know him. He started out, of course, as Saul. Uh, God changed his name in due time to Paul and used him like no other man. Uh, half of the New Testament was penned by the Apostle Paul, given to him by God. He was the human instrument that penned the words. He established at least seven churches. He had two preachers that he personally trained for the ministry, Timothy and Titus, countless others that ministered with him and helped him and were his fellow workers and his fellow soldiers, as he'd like to call them, uh, in the gospel. Uh, he preached the gospel from prisoners in the jail cell to uh, kings in palaces. Uh, Paul, amazing, amazing ministry that we have laid out for us in the Bible. Another man, how many are familiar with the name D.L. Moody? Are you familiar with that name? Quite a few of you are. And uh, D.L. Moody was greatly used of God as well. It is said of D.L. Moody, he had one million converts in America and one million converts in Europe. Uh, amazing man, D.L. Moody, that only, by the way, had an eighth grade education. And R.A. Torrey, uh, the most unlikely of partners, associates with D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey was a brilliant man. Uh, he was Dr. R.A. Torrey, and that was an earned doctorate, a very scholarly man, and uh, yet a great, great friend and companion and eventually successor to Dwight L. Moody. And oftentimes, uh, uh, R.A. Torrey was asked, why did God use D.L. Moody? And he was asked that so many times, he actually prepared a message, and he used to preach a message on why God used D.L. Moody. And he listed seven reasons why God used D.L. Moody. I'm going to give you those seven reasons tonight. And that's not the message, by the way. This is just extra. You don't pay any extra for this one, all right? Uh, number one, he was fully surrendered to God. He was fully surrendered to God. Number two, he was a man of prayer. Number three, he said he was a deep and practical student of the Bible. Number four, he was a humble man. Number five, he was free from the love of money. Number six, he had a consuming passion for the lost. And number seven, he was endued with power from on high. Seven reasons that God used D.L. Moody. Now, when we hear things like that, and we know what God did with Paul, we know what God did with men like D.L. Moody, and we could talk about other men that you might be familiar with and men that we know from history were greatly used of God. Uh, but I got news for you tonight. God doesn't just desire to use them. God desires to use you and me. A lot of times we, we'll hear that, God did this with that person, or God can do this, and we, we say, amen, God can do that. And then when the preacher says, yeah, but God wants to do it in you and through you, we, uh-oh, yeah, God wants to use each one of us. And he's looking for people who are desired to be used by God. The apostle Paul, or Saul at this time, when he, now this is his conversion that we read about in Acts chapter 9, his salvation experience, if you will, and He's riding to Damascus. He's going there to persecute Christians, to arrest Christians. And um, the Lord Jesus uh, appears to him. Um, they're shined a light 
verse 3, about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And then he said, He trembling and astonished said, Lord. The first time he said, Lord, he had no idea who he's talking to. Who are you? Who are you? Who is this? Man, he didn't know what's going on. He just has his bright light and he's knocked off whatever he's riding on, and he's on the ground, and he says, uh, Who are you, Lord? Uh, kind of using Lord um, like we would use the word sir. Uh, who are you, sir? If somebody can shine a light bright enough to knock you off your horse and put you on your knees, you better call him sir. And uh, he called him, Who are you, sir? And then he said, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Oh, then he says, Lord. So he just called Jesus Lord. What? Notice the question he asked. First thing he asked, what wilt thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus said, arise and go into the city and be told thee what you should do. Uh, each of us, hey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever got alone with God and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do with the... I, I, I'm not sure about that term even. What do you want me to do with the life you've given to me? I don't want to think about it. Be, be careful about saying it's my life. It's the life he's given to us. God gives us, I think, through this account of Saul, how we can be used of God. How we can be used of God. Several things. Number one, notice the first thing we need in order to be used by God is revelation revelation what what God gave to Saul he desires to give to each one of us so we too can be used of God with our life and the first thing he gave him was revelation what is that verse 4 the light from heaven the light from heaven you say well I got saved I didn't see a light from heaven oh no 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 God gave you a light from heaven and you're looking at one in your lap this evening this is the light from heaven that God has given to each one of us thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Uh, this is the word of God. I think what the, what the sin-cursed world needs, what this dark world needs, what this corrupt world needs, I believe it needs the light of the word of God. I think the more Bible we could have and the more Bible we get in the hands of people and the more scripture we get out into the world, the, 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 we can poke some holes in the darkness of this world and we can poke some holes in the darkness of America. Uh, the revel revelation is God giving his word to us. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means every single bit of scripture that you're holding in your hand tonight was given by God. There's no part of the Bible you say, well, this was Paul's opinion, or this was what Peter thought. No, no man's opinion got into it. This is what God's opinion is. This is what God says. These are the words of God. God gave the words, and men wrote those words down. The, the, this Bible, the Bible you're holding tonight, listen to me, this is unlike any other book you have, any other book you'll ever hold. And there's no other book like this one in the Library of Congress. They, they lay claim to being the largest library in the world. They have more than 130 million items on approximately 530 miles of bookshelves. The collection includes more than 29 million books, 2.7 million recordings, 12 million photographs, 4.8 million maps, and 58 million manuscripts. But of all those volumes, listen to me, only one lays claim to being alive and powerful. Just one, and that's the Bible. That's the only one. It is the only book that says it's living. The Word of God is, is alive, it's quick, and it's powerful, and it's, 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 it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible's no dead letter. The Bible's a living book. It'll, it won't just inform you, though it will inform you, but it will also transform you. 
you just begin to read it and you begin to study it and you begin to memorize it and you begin to meditate on it and it will transform your life. Gypsy Smith, the great evangelist, told of a man who, who said to him that he'd received no inspiration from the Bible, though he'd gone through it several times. And Gypsy Smith looked at him and said, well, you've been through it several times, but you just let it go through you once, and you'll never be the same. I agree with that completely. Boy, the Bible gives us light on so many things, does it not? Uh, doesn't the Bible give you light about salvation? doesn't it give the Bible light on heaven. It gives you light on hell. It gives you light about forgiveness. It gives you light uh, about uh, future events. It gives you light about judgment. It gives you light about eternity. It gives you light about the cross. It gives you light about the resurrection. It gives you light about creation. Uh, all these things, the light comes on because we have the Word of God and we understand the Bible. So the very first thing you need, hey, I'm so glad that God gave us a revelation. What would you do tonight? Where would we be tonight if we didn't have a Bible? What would you, how, how would we live? How would we know what God wants? How would we ever know what, what would please God or how to live for God? What would we ever take to anybody to try to get them saved if you couldn't take the Bible? Uh, yesterday when Brother Chuck, we were talking to that fellow, what would we do if we say, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven. Say, well, I tell you what, uh, let me tell you what I think. Well, that's good until the next guy comes along and tells him what he thinks. No, you say, listen, let me show you from the Bible what God says about know, how to know you're going to heaven when you die. It's the Word of God. It's powerful. It's the incorruptible seed. It's the only book. By the way, it's the only book that ever has been inspired by God. Make sure you understand that. So we have to have, number one, revelation. The second thing that we need to be used by God is a realization. A realization. A realization of what? That man is a fallen creature. Man is a fallen being. When Saul, uh, when he saw the light, he fell to the earth. He fell to the earth. We, we call in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, we call that the fall of man, don't we? Uh, man's a fallen creature. And man, wherefore as by one man, death entered into the world, and death by, or, or death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That one man was Adam in the Garden of Eden. And, and sin passed upon every one of us. Man is not, listen, man is born a sinner. Man is not a sinner because he sins. He sins because he is a sinner. And that's why men can't stop sinning. Because that is the nature of man. Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Okay? I know sometimes we get soft and we say, oh, I think they're a good person. Okay? No, no, no. There's, there, there's none good but God. Uh, that's what the scripture says. And uh, we get a little softy there and get a little soft-hearted and we don't speak the truth. But man, listen, the whole, the whole, whole difference in philosophy, the whole difference in principle is the, 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 the unsaved man in the world, their, their world view is man is basically good. And therefore, though if you just educate him and you just inform him, he'll make good choices. But the Bible says man is basically evil. He is a sinner. And you inform him and you educate him, you'll have an informed, educated sinner. And he'll make sinful choices. And that's the, whole, that's the whole difference in approach and philosophy. We have to understand, you have to realization, man is lost. Man needs a Savior. Mankind is not okay left alone. Man needs God. And listen, he's dead in trespasses and sins. He can't help himself. So there's nothing he can do to, to save himself. That's why... That's why we have the Word of God. To, to with the realization that man is lost, we take the incorrupt, incorruptible seed, the powerful Word of God, and we take it to the lost. You say, well, why would they listen to us? They may not listen to us, but the Word of God's powerful. It's powerful. It'll penetrate anyone's dark soul. Mr. Thorpe was in 18th century Bristol, England, Mr. Thorpe was a part of a band of men who called themselves the Hellfire Club. 
Their reason for existence was to mock and ridicule the work of the famed evangelist George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a, an incredible preacher in the 18th century. Whitfield would preach sometimes. They, they say he, he could preach to crowds sometimes that, that were a mile and up to two miles away from him. He would stand on a balcony and crowds would extend out of the field and you could hear his voice audibly and clearly for up to two miles. And in case you didn't know, in 18th century, they didn't have any microphones. Boy, that's a set of lungs, brother. And he preached, uh, I think he preached over, wow, it was like over 900 times or something like that. He preached a famous sermon called, You Must Be Born Again. And the newspapers used to come to him and say, Mr. Whitfield, why do you always preach and you preach so often on you must be born again? And he looked at him and smiled and said, because ye must be born again. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, Thorpe and his friends called Evangelist Whitfield Mr. Squint Squintum because of Whitfield's eyes. He delivered his sermon with brilliant accuracy, perfectly uh, int imitating his tone and facial expression as he quoted scripture and Whitfield's exposition. So he's mocking the evangelist and reading scripture and, and imitating him, reading his, reading his notes. In those days, you know, often they would print the, the, the minister's sermon in the newspaper. They did that even in America, uh, even into the 1900s, I believe. And while he's mocking him, his tone, his facial expression, and he's quoting scripture that Whitfield used in his sermon, and his friends are laughing, and it says, suddenly amidst the laughter, he had to sit down, for he was pierced through with conviction. And he said he was converted on the spot. Here he was, a thoroughly nasty man, engaged in a nasty action, and yet the word of God pierced his heart and changed him in an instant. He went on to be a prominent Christian leader in the city of Bristol. And that, that was related, by the way, by Charles Spurgeon, who gave that illustration. So we need a realization that man is lost. You have to, you have to understand, man... The Bible says, he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on name. So see, some people think, well, if people don't hear, then they'll go to heaven anyway. Well, then we're better off to keep people ignorant. See, that's a false premise. That is not true. He that believeth not is condemned already. They're already under condemnation. So we have to go get the gospel to them. Have a realization that man is lost and man is fallen. We have to get the gospel to them. Number three, we have a revelation. We have a realization that man is lost. We have, number three, the recognition. You have to have a recognition of who your master is. Who is my master? Verse five, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Who's your master? Look at John chapter 13 with me, would you please? Uh, Acts 9, just go back to your left a little bit to the Gospel of John chapter 13. Jesus with his disciples here. This is the feet washing account that Jesus did in the upper room. He's all done. And notice verse 13, what Jesus says. Jesus says, you call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. The point I want to get there is from verse 13. He says, you call me Master and Lord, and you do well, because that's what I am. Jesus is your Savior, but is he your Master? Is he your Lord as well? You see, Jesus, how many understand, he doesn't force himself to be Savior on anybody. If somebody doesn't want him, then Jesus doesn't come to them. You 
Jesus looked at some folks and said, hey, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He would that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But are all men saved? No. Why not? Because they won't come. You will not come to me that you might have life. It's not on Jesus' part. It's on their part. And they're not willing to come. And, and listen, then let me, let me tell you, the same thing is true when you receive him as your Savior and you will not allow him to be the master of your life. He won't force himself on you that way. He wants you to acknowledge him as the master of your life. There, there are many believers who have Jesus as their Savior, but they, they are still in control of their life, not Jesus. They are still calling the shots of their life, not Jesus. To be used of God, you have to come to a point in your life when you're willing to allow Jesus to take control of your life. You have to come to a point where you'll say, people will no longer control my life. You have to come to a point when you say, circumstances will no longer control my life. You have to say, money will no longer control my life. You have to come when you say, my, my work will no longer control my life. You have to come to the point where you say, convenience will not control my life. And maybe the worst and the biggest of all, you have to come to the point where you say, I won't control my life anymore. Jesus will control my life. He deserves to be your master. He purchased you with his own blood when he died on the cross. He deserves to be your master. So you need a revelation. We got that in the Bible. You need a realization that man is fallen and needs to be saved. You need a recognition of who your master is. Will you? Jesus looked at his disciples one day and he said, Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Doesn't go together, does it? Say, yes, sir. And then go do what you want anyway. Oh, is he in control of your life tonight? Or are you in control? Maybe the reason you get so frustrated is because you're in control. And God's trying to let you know that he is to be in control. But you yield that up to him. Let me give you number four. Responsibility. A revelation, a realization, a recognition, and now four is a responsibility. Verse number 6, he says, What wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And of course, as he goes into the city, uh, God has already talked to Ananias. And uh, he tells him, You're going to go talk to this Saul. And Ananias is a little apprehensive as he talks to the Lord. He says, Lord, I've heard what this guy did. And, and you know, it's, it's, you ever done that? You ever told God something like you're informing God that maybe something he didn't catch or he didn't know about? Uh, it's kind of funny when we read it, you know, things like God didn't, well, you're a kid, man, and I just, wow, I, I didn't realize that. I wasn't up on that. But um, he, he tells him, but the Lord said, look at verse 15, go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then Ananias went and called him Brother Saul. I like that. He obeyed what the Lord wanted to do. So here's the responsibility. Saul was soon going to discover his mission. His, his responsibility was that he is going to be part of the Great Commission of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. That's going to be his mission. And by the way, that's not just his mission. That's our mission. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 16, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And that has nothing to do with salvation. He says, You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That's what God has ordained. That's what God's chosen each of us to do. Every one of us has a mission. Every one of us has to realize our responsibility 
in this, it, to be used of God, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel to every creature, to take the gospel everywhere we go. I want to help you tonight. Your mission is not to work in the factory. Your mission is not to push papers at a desk. Your mission isn't to be behind the wheel of a truck or a vehicle. Your mission is not to be a foreman or a supervisor. No, no, no. Your mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your mission is to bring men and women to Jesus Christ. Our mission is to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, and the mission, and by the way, I think you ought to, there, there's times, that's why there's so many times. I think you ought to have times when that's what you purposefully do. Will you purposefully say, I'm going to spend the next hour and a half or the next two hours, and I'm going out with the sole purpose of trying to give the gospel to people. And it can be any day of the week, it can be any time of the week, just say, that's what I'm going to do. But listen, don't compartmentalize your soul winning to that time. Don't, don't do that and then not think about souls the rest of the week. But everywhere you go, when you get your groceries and when you stop for gasoline and when you, listen, be aware of the people around you. And be aware of the, the, some divine appointments God gives you. And be always, always have tracks with you. Always have a New Testament with you. Always be ready to witness and give the gospel and lead people to Christ. It's our responsibility. Our mission is to go. Listen, he said, you, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you. You should go and bring forth fruit. I'm talking to people tonight. You can't say you don't remember and you don't know if you've ever led another soul to Jesus Christ. And the problem isn't that you don't know how to lead a soul to Christ. The problem isn't you don't have the means to lead a soul to Christ. You're missing those two little letters that spell the word go. The Lord said, I've ordained you to go and bring forth fruit. You never bring forth fruit if you don't go. You have to go. You know, the old... Uh, Lottery thing always says you can't win if you don't. You can't ever win anybody if you don't go. And it's okay. Listen, I, 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 it, if I'm going to the store, I go to the store. But but besides besides bread, milk, or whatever else you want to buy, uh, when you're at the store, you ought to have on there. Give the gospel. Give the gospel to somebody. Give the word of God to somebody. Be amazed to who God will place in your path. And be ready with the mission. Always keep the mission in mind. No matter where you are, keep the mission in mind. We have a responsibility to win others to Christ. Ezekiel says, if you don't warn the sinner from their way, God says, their blood will require your hand. Now, I don't know what all that means, to be honest with you. But I don't want to find out what it means. <laughs> I don't want to know what that means. I'm sure it's not anything good. To have blood dripping off your hands, usually that's a bad thing. Okay? Not a good sign. And so I want to fulfill my responsibility. What does it take to be used by God? Revelation. A realization that man has fallen. A recognition of who your master is. It takes a responsibility, a responsibility to win others to Christ. And then number five. It takes a knowledge that resurrection power is available. A knowledge that resurrection power is is available. Don't, don't miss the fact that in verse 9, Saul was without sight for three days and three nights. And didn't get that back till after three days and three nights. Is that just coincidence? I don't think so. I think the Lord's reminding him of the three days and the three nights that Jesus was in the tomb. Maybe, maybe that's something Saul mocked. I don't know. Maybe it's something he made fun of to the Christians. Because the, the, it was commonly reported that, remember, the disciples stole his body. Maybe he mocked that and Jesus said, okay, I'll, I'll give you three days and three nights. We'll see how that works. And, and, and th there's, there's power. There's power available to you and me. There's power available. And it's the person, by the way, it's the person of the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. You receive the Holy Spirit of God in and, 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 and Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. When Jesus says, you're going to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Before he gets to that part, what did he say in the very first part of the verse? 
but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me. Again, listen, you can witness if you want. And I've been, I've been a Christian a long time, been a soul winner a long time. I know what it's like to witness in the power of staying slave long. And I know what it's like to witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Boy, there's no comparison. <laughs> there's no comparison. I want to witness in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, when Jesus, look, in fact, look there. You're in Acts. Go back to Matthew 28, will you? Matthew 28, last chapter of the book of Matthew. Uh, the last few verses, you know, it's the Great Commission. I want you to see this. We usually look at verses 19 and 20. Verses 19 and 20 that say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And we talk about the Great Commission. But what about verse 18? Before he gave that commission, what did he say? Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Therefore is always there because you have to look and see what it's there for. And so you always look at the verses prior to that. And Jesus is saying, Because all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, you can go. How can we go to Japan and give the gospel? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. You have to have the power of God to take the people to another country. The power of God to take the gospel to, to, to every creature. Say, can you just meet somebody on the street and talk to them or meet somebody at McDonald's and talk to them about Jesus and, and, and they'll accept Christ their Savior? Yes, that's possible. How? The power of God. It has to be God. Know the power of God. Most of us, like the old preacher said, most of us know what it ain't. I'd sure like to know what it is. The power of God in our life. Saul was a blasphemer. Saul was a persecutor. Uh, back in Acts 9, when we read verse number 1, remember? He was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. You understand what a slaughter is when you're talking about human beings? That's what Saul was threatening. Okay? And here's a blasphemer, a persecutor, his own words. And now, most of us, if somebody mentions Paul, we think apostle, preacher, missionary, church planner, uh, uh, scripture writer, uh, soul winner. How'd that happen? The power of God. I don't know all the backgrounds of everybody here, but if we, uh, Brother Chuck and I, I think we were talking about the other day, boy, if, if, you know, if you knew, if you knew some of the people, you, you just look at them now, but you didn't know them 25 years ago. If, if you'd have seen Don Taylor 25 years ago, you'd say, no way. No way. Well, how do you get to, how do you get to be this, this man he is now Compared to 25, 30 years ago. I'll tell you how the power of God does that. The power of God does that. I don't know what, what, don't underestimate the power of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Don't underestimate that power. Boy, they underestimated a Pentecost and 3,000 got saved on Pentecost. The power of God. Revelation, a realization that man has fallen, the recognition of who my master is, the responsibility of our mission, which is the Great Commission, and that resurrection power is available. Henry Varley was a very close friend of Dwight Moody. When he was very young in the ministry, D.L. Moody told Henry Varley that he had heard a preacher say, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man who is completely yielded to him. D.L. Moody told Varley, Mr. Varley, he said, by the grace of God, I will be that man.
after Moody was passed, went on to heaven. Ari Torrey made this statement when Henry Varley relayed that story to Ari Torrey. And Ari Torrey was with D.L. Moody throughout his ministry. Ari Torrey said, I don't think that it remains to be seen. I think the world has seen it in D.L. Moody. That's an amazing statement. Now the question tonight is, do you desire to be used by God? There ought, to be, there ought to be something in your heart to say, God, use me. God, use me. Have you ever said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Say, oh, preacher, I'm, I'm too old for that. You're never too old for that. God, God had Moses go back and deliver the children of Israel. He was 80. Hmm? Even you, Jeanette. Okay. You never know. We were talking with um, the Callahans at lunch, and Mrs. Callahan was relating to us how uh, Chuck had got out of the military, retired from the military, and they were he was like forty four, was he? And the the pastor was calling them up on deputate when they would go on deputation. The pastor would call them up and use them as illustration that you're never too old for God to use you and to call you to do something. <laughs> what a blessing that was, huh? But you know what? That's the truth. It is the truth. Don't, don't think, don't, don't look and say, uh, no, no, man, I've got a good job, and I've got, I've got four kids, and I don't know, man, how, how can I leave all this and, and go serve God somewhere? Hmm? Ask Ron Morton and Ann Morton if that's possible. All you have to do is just be willing to say, God, what do you want me to do? Now, God may have you stay right where you are. And God may have you keep doing what you're doing. But you ought to be doing that because you know that's what God wants you to do, not just because you don't want to ask God what he wants you to do. Okay? Be used of God. Certainly, God's going to have some people stay put and serve the Lord. And, and support the church and support missionaries. Surely God's going to do that. But surely God's going to call some to go. Will you ask God, what will you have me to do? Will you, like we said this morning, Bobby Richardson, will you say, God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, to be used of God? Let's pray together, shall we, Father? I pray you'll take the truth now this evening. Lord, thank you for using the Apostle Paul. Thank you, Lord, for using men in history that we know of. And Lord, thank you most of all that you're willing to use us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to know that whatever you ask us to do, you'll equip us to do. You'll enable us to do. We have the power of God as our resource. We have the word of God. Oh, Lord, I pray people will ask tonight, Lord, what would you have me to do? God, use me. Use me. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many people are here tonight. I, it doesn't matter your age. I, I hope there's some young people here that will say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? You say, well, I got plans. I got it all figured out. I got all laid out what I'm going to do. Is that what God wants you to do? Are you sure that's what God wants you to do? Have you said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Or did you just lay out your plans and say, this is what I've got? Okay, God, take it, bless it now. I wonder if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I really do desire to be used of God. And I don't care if you're 6 or if you're 60 or if you're 66. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm willing, Pastor, I'm willing tonight to say, Lord, what do you want me to do?
I just want to be used by God. God's will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing less. Pastor, the Lord has dealt with my heart tonight. Please pray for me. We just lift your hand up. God bless you. Amen. 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 That's wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray. Then we'll have an invitation. Will you yield to God? Will you can ask that question as at the altar? Just lay yourself on the altar and say, God, whatever you want with my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. What wilt thou have me to do? Heavenly Father, bless this invitation. Thank you for speaking to hearts. I pray that maybe you'll speak to somebody's heart like you spoke to an 18-year-old's heart almost 40 years ago. And I remember kneeling down at an altar and saying, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. And I pray tonight there'd be some folks that say, Lord, I'll do anything. Scrap my plans. I want your plans. I want to be used by God in my life. Lord, have your will and way in every heart and life, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand, our pianist will play. As she begins to play, Bob's going to sing. And the Lord has spoken to your heart. You come tonight. my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love at the impulse of thy love take my feet
Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for being a God that desires to use us. Lord, we realize we're very unworthy vessels. But thank you, Lord, that your power is available to us. That you'll fill us with your spirit. We'll be endued with power from on high as we go to preach the gospel and fulfill our mission. So, Lord, help us to be about your business this week. Lord, I pray that each and every day this week we would have the thought in our mind and our hearts several times a day, Lord, use me today. May we understand that as we go about our other duties that life requires, that's not our mission. Our mission is to go and preach the gospel. So, Father, help us to be ready. Help us to be always ready ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason to the hope that lies within us. May others see Christ in our life this week, Lord. We love you. Thank you for a wonderful day today in church. Lord, we love you. We pray that you'll use us this week for your glory and for your honor. It's in Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's sing that together, shall we? It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.